It's your turn, Polet. Hello. Huh? What? When did you get the filmmaking bug? Oh. Probably when I was a child, which is no big surprise. I spent most of my time in my father's studio filming faces. I loved faces. That's how I got my nickname, Little Fellini. After all, the movie Tag Lot was a little bit like a circus, like something at a Fellini satiricon. And the face my camera loved the most belonged to my father, Sam Gettleman. According to my mother, there was a time when Sam Gittleman was personable, friendly. He could get along with anybody. I think the trouble started when, when he began working as an assistant in Hollywood. Dad worked for five years in a, a very abusive corporate environment, and gradually he began to change. Mom said he became so dangerously obsessed with his career and struggle for power that he got an ulcer once every two months. She said he reminded her of a, an angry, warmongering general. He was short-tempered and infatuated with his enemies. I mean, he fixated on what he saw as his inevitable demise, even as his career was skyrocketing. I think one of the main reasons I'm making this movie is because I'm interested in how Hollywood changes people, like the way it changed my father. Camera. Sound. Slated. Um, my mom wants me to go to med school. But I don't want to discover the next Madonna or boys to men, and I've landed one of the highest paid and most respected assistant positions in town. I graduated summa cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania. I could have done anything I wanted. You know, Wall Street or Washington. But nothing was challenging enough. Nothing, that is, except for the role of motion picture agent. Oh, no. No, 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 no. No, I gotta get out of this. I mean, if he sees this program, you have no idea the things he's capable of doing to me. Then one day at my uh, grandfather's for Sunday brunch, Papa showed me... Papa's my grandfather. <laughs> Papa showed me this article from the New York Times. It said that Borscht Belt Jews who were from Manhattan and graduated Ivy League colleges were shoe-ins at any Hollywood talent agency. Like he says, you like to eat a lot, you like to talk a lot, so you should feel right at home being an agent. <laughs> so a couple weeks later, I came out to Los Angeles for a meeting with one of the partners. And I was hired the very next day. And for the past three weeks now, I have been working with one of the most prestigious talent agencies in Hollywood. I work with Roman here at the agency. Thomas delivers the mail. <clears throat> That's right. I deliver the mail. I'm the mail clerk. What's it like out there at the agency, Thomas? What it's like out there? Hmm. Hmm. It's like my bar mitzvah, where I kept on thinking I'm going to drop the Torah. My Sephardic grandfather is going to have a stroke right there in the synagogue because I'm going to drop the Torah. The rabbi says to me, take it. I said, I'm gonna drop it. We must have argued for about three minutes until he just shoved it into my arms. Well, I dropped the Torah. My grandfather had a stroke. Well, that's what it's like out there. Let me tell you about the first day as a trainee in the mailroom and the warm welcome I received from my superior. Push the cart! 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 After I loaded up the cart, I went upstairs to do the mail run. This was it. The hall of power, where deals were made. It was just like in the article my grandfather had read to me. I knew I had made the right career decision. And what are you? Valium covered with skin? Put another engine into your arsehole if you want to keep working here, boy! Great. Another poxy incompetent. Jonathan, the best
best thing for you to do right now is not think it is react. When you think you get both of us in trouble. When I ask you to clean your cubicle, please just fucking do what I ask. Hi, I'm Thomas Jacobs. It's nice to meet you. You're late, schmuck. Oh. What exactly did you say to him? I said to him that you were on the phone, you'd call him back. Well, was it a, a when he feels like it, you insignificant fly on my ass calls you back? Or he doesn't even know who you are calls you back? I just said to get back to him. Fine. Call Tiffany's, send him over a pen with the following engraving. Write it down. Always love to talk. Don't forget the L. We got egos on the line here, so you better start learning to fine-tune your phone etiquette. The ten pages of that phone log are my Bible, the axis upon which my whole world turns. Don't forget it. You dump the B-list calls, you know, the, the, the insignificance, during lunch. Do you need to get through or what? Yes, sir. Well, come on through. Oh, you're the new boy, right? Yes, sir. Oh, nice blazer. The tie doesn't go. Go ahead. Sorry, sir. Mm -hmm. Have a good day, sir. Mm -hmm. Morning, Roman. Hey, little brother. How you doing this morning? Better than you. God, what are they doing to you down there? I got to work a double today. Oh, come here, come here. Mm -hmm. Sit down. Relax. Relax. You ever been to a premiere party, Thomas? No. Well, I got plans tonight. Take an actress. Here. Here's one. Actresses put out the premieres. Hey, thanks, man. No problem. If I could ever do anything for you. Yeah, Mr. Saban's office. Uh, I'm working on it. D don't call me at the office. <clears throat> yeah, OK. God. Somebody giving you a hard time? <laughs> this junior assistant at some bargain basement agency across the way, I mean, he calls me out of the blue. I barely know him. He wants the inside scoop on our new specs. Like I'm gonna tell him anything before we've even had lunch. <laughs> you must get that a lot working for the head of the agency. Yeah. I tell you, I can relate to these guys, but I can't hang out with them. They're a bunch of backstabbers. But in you, I see a reflection of myself. Good background, education, good family values. You know, I couldn't agree with you more. I think you and I are going to be very good friends. And friends help each other out, right, Thomas? Yeah, they do, definitely. You know the, uh, with Deadly Prayers, right? It's the new Esther House spec script. I knew the kid was sharp. Anyway, they're faxing the first 30 pages over to Mel's agent this week for packaging. And, uh, well, I'll just slip me a copy from the mail room. Here's my home address. Isn't that script a confidential property? No. Thomas, confidential only means that non-players can't see it. But you're gonna be a player soon, so what's the problem? No problem. Couldn't I get in trouble for this? Thomas, I'll give you a piece of advice. There's people in this town that can't see past their own cubicle. I mean, there's people like us. See the big picture. Don't have tunnel vision. Okay, let me think about it. <laughs> Listen, that premiere starts at 7.30. Why don't you do this? Mr. Sabine needs an assistant on PE today. That'll give you plenty of time to think, and then you come back to me with your answer. Um, what's PE? you're a grunt. If you survive the punishment, you get yourself promoted to a desk. Yes, but Thomas, you're promoted a lot faster if you know the right people. I've always been able to succeed on my own terms. I'm used to it. I'm a Hebe. Excuse me, uh, what's Hebe? You know, Jewish, Hebrew, Hebe. Humility, economy, and bravery. My great uncle's wife's half sister was Jewish. Does that mean I'm Hebe? Sure. You're a Hebrew. 
That was a funny one. You know, I joined the uh, Temple of the Film of Arts. They say you could make deals on Friday night Shabbat services. Oh, sure. They should just call that Studio Synagogues, where 50% of the congregation is converts. And studio execs. I converted a month after arriving in Los Angeles because, quite frankly, you want to be a player in this town? It helps if you're Jewish. Oh, that's anti-Semitic. How can I be anti-Semitic? I'm a Jew now. Well, it's my turn to tell the story. Okay. Move back. No, back more. Mr. Queen, this is as far as we can go. You're really indiscernible. Am I really small in frame? There's nothing to worry about. Okay. See, I work in the mail room of Black Pictures. And my first day began with a spitball in the neck from the mailroom boss, Ozzie Blatt. He loves spitballs. Prescription drugs and heavy metal, too. Well, anyway, to get on his good side, I made the mistake of telling him that I loved heavy metal. Well, he instantly decided that we were gonna be friends, and he made a present in my honor. Put a face! Ah, put a face! <laughs> Dedicated to my new friend and fellow Satanist. You do believe in the powers of Satan, don't you? Well, actually, sir. Ah! Ozzy Black, Postal Engineer. Where's my mail? What? Bring me my mail. I can't do that now. I can't do that now. When am I gonna get my mail? When I feel like it. When I feel like it. When I feel like it. I want my mail. Yeah, you're welcome. Dick. Who? Oh, one of the VPs. Wait, but you could talk to the executives like that? Pick. My father owns a studio. I can do whatever the hell I want. Now, I had heard that the last guy who had stuck it out for over a year with Ozzy had been promoted to an executive position. See, Ozzy's father had decided that if someone was tough enough to spend 12 hours a day locked in a cubicle with his Meshuggah son, why, then he was certainly tough enough to produce Polly Shore movies. Now, this was called the Ozzy test. Oh, I knew that I could pass this. Matter of fact, I think it's time to listen to my high school band. Ladies and gentlemen, Get ready for the Bob Rock! Yeah, my uh, my probation officer says that music decreases my violent outburst. I'll tell you something, it's definitely helping with that schizophrenia. <laughs> See, nobody knows bad like Pink knows bad. It's not an earthquake, guys. It's just the last member of our group, and he's a bit theatrical. Cut the fucking music! Name's Palermo. D. Palermo. <laughs> Let's get one thing straight. I'm not an assistant anymore. I used to be. Let me tell you about the job I had. I'll never forget the day he fired me. I picked him up in my car at LAX. We were late for the agenting class he teaches over at USC. So we thought we would just drag race through South Central. Then I blew a tire over a pothole. Guess who had to change it? Every day, I'm haunted by the memory of that dick. Hey, but you don't like this. No, 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 no. I fucking hate butts. Look, I didn't get a table in the front. I did not get a table in the front. Ignorante! Bastarde! Buffon! Go! You have fucked me! Fuck me! Fuck me! Fuck me! Now this was my boss, Griffin the Roach, one of Hollywood's top talent agents. While we were stuck in the middle of hell, all he cared about was a table I forgot to book at Spago. He told me I was finished in Hollywood and that he'd leave a horse's severed head in my bed the next day. Meanwhile, as he ranted at me, the locals had begun to congregate. The intern's car is here. Come on! Come on, let's go! You fight! Go!
Why don't you tell everyone what you're planning on doing, Dean? I, Dean Palermo, of the Palermo family. Originally of Palermo, Sicily, I'm about to make a film that is going to scar Paul LaRoche. And like all that politically correct documentary, I'm going to take a giant shit on the face of Hollywood. And I'm going to grab the handle so they can't flush it. Roman, why don't you give us your take on the film business? <laughs> take notes, kids. Ever since I was 12 years old, I knew I wanted to be a player. You see, my family came out to Hollywood for this vacation. And the first place I visited was the boulevard. Everyone does. I must have spent half the day taking pictures of everything like some tourist. It was when I decided to walk off the boulevard that it happened. This old man who looked like Geppetto, you know, from Snow White, just seemed to come out of nowhere and introduced himself. He said that he was a legendary Adolf Zuckerman, the studio mogul, you guys. He told me that he was around Hollywood when the town first began. He explained to me that he had gotten his start as Charlie Chaplin's assistant director. That afternoon, we walked all over town, and he told me what Hollywood used to be like in its heyday, the golden age. At the end of the day, and this is the best part of the story, he took me to Movie Tech, the studio which he founded and ran for 30 years. He told me about all the movies the studio made, and all the great actors, directors, and writers that he worked with there. He told me that being a player was the greatest time of his life, and he wished that he could do it all over again. And he suggested that one day, I could become a player in Hollywood. Now jump ahead 15 years. I'm a graduate of Penn, and I find myself standing in the exact same place I stood with Adolf. In no time, I got myself a temp job, and one day, I saw the prettiest girl in all of film land. <laughs> you knew that was, Paulette. You. You actually smiled. I mean, nobody else in the lot would give a floater like me the time of day. So I knew I should try to meet you. Well, every guy in the lot wanted to meet you. <laughs> what a Twinkie. Didn't cost much to make friends with the guys in transportation, and I scored a golf cart, swung by, and picked you up 15 minutes before your usual appointment. And I got gotcha. you. Booze. And you can guess what happened then. Love, exciting and new. <laughs> to fill the rest of you guys in, Paulette and I have been dating for over a year now. Now at the time, I didn't know she was the daughter of Sam Gittleman, the current head of the studio, <laughs> or I wouldn't have been so bold. Paulette introduced me to him, even asked him to make a few calls on my behalf. The very first one landed me my top assistant job at the Sabine Agency. <laughs> Unlike the other trainees, Listen carefully, Jacobson. I didn't have to start in the mailroom. So you want to know my take on the film business? Well, it's cars, lunches, green lights, and studio executives' daughters. OK, tell us about your job, Fisher. Well, there's a real opportunity for me to grow within the company. You see. I've loved music videos ever since I was a kid. I mean, I was obsessed with them. I began to turn into a video. I mean, I mimicked every artist from Michael Jackson to Twisted Sister. And you see, I mean, this play acting made me feel a real connection to the world. All right, some kids had Atari, but I had music video. 16 years later, well, two weeks ago to be specific, I got a very special phone call. God was on the line. Hello? And Fisher Lovelace, please. Yeah, this is Fisher. What is it? Fisher, this is Roger Peabody. Roger. A bad boy music? Oh, Mr. Peabody. Um, yes, what can I do for you, sir? Roger Peabody was the man who was there when video killed the radio star. I mean, name any early videos. Beat it, Hungry Like the Wolf, Rock Me Amadeus. I mean, Roger put them together, all right? And since then, well, Roger's made thousands of music videos. I mean, he set trends. And there's one thing that's no secret about Roger. It's, this is, this is wild side, okay? I mean, this is a man who learned to party from Warhol. I mean, he even built his own, his own nightclub, kind of like a 90s version of the factory. It's called the Love Shack. 
And, 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 and that's where he wanted me to come that night. I mean, to interview to be his personal assistant. It was an opportunity for a lifetime. I was so excited. I was like, ooh! Hey, Lamb Chop, welcome to the Love Shack. <clears throat> let me clear my throat before I give you a quote. So let me see your credentials, because I believe it's essential for your potential. Or should I call you Rich Almond, tasting thighs, sugar-coated, brown eyes? Why don't you take this big dog home and bury his bone? Hi, um, my name's Fisher Lovelace. I'm here to see Roger Peabody. <laughs> oh, Roger's new toy. Another clean-cut boy. Follow the balloons upstairs, and tonight will be your lucky night, Fisher Lovelace. Fisher Lovelace, good to see you. Sorry to call you here at one in the morning, but you know what I always say, music never sleeps. <laughs> 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 now, why don't you take your clothes off? Excuse me, sir? Yo, everybody, listen up! I want you to meet Roger's new assistant, Fisher Lovely! Yeah, I got you! Yeah, I got you. And, uh, I mean, yeah, I have to deal with my boss's wild lifestyle. But he said if I can stick it out, there's no telling where I can go with the company. You ready? Action. This is where I live. This is my bed. Actually, I stole the frame from the set of Coppola's Dracula. What's that? In Sunday school. Yeah. They told me to draw a picture of God. And I did. And I got an act. Oh, for frenzy. Oh my God. <laughs> Tell us how you became a filmmaker. Hold on. Give me a sec. Inside this box is how it all began. A present I received from a stranger on my 10th birthday.
When my cameraman was hit by a car, my camera was taken away from me. My mother told me that I was going to have to find something more responsible to do with my life. I still love movies. So, many years later after graduating college, I got a job working at a top talent agency. When I was fired and left for dead by Griffin the Roach, I received my wake-up call. I was a filmmaker again, and Griffin the Roach was going to be my star. This is where I come to discover up-and-coming talent. Wow. And they really love me here. Tiffany, trust me, there are big things in store for you. Give me a kiss. Give me a kiss. Come on. Give me another <laughs> one. <laughs> Taking such a beating, served coffee at his meetings, I played the screaming game. My soul and drive, he tried to make. He was always angry. Can you wait for the climax? Now I'm a mess. Confess that my name is Dean fucking Palermo. This is Griffin LaRoche, the most despicable, most disgusting agent in Hollywood. Hey, why don't you tell the camera how many clients you've lost this year, Mr. Pig LaRoche? And what about the times you bad out the studios? Fuck Tristar, fuck Warner Brothers, fuck Columbia, fuck. Okay, since we've interviewed you last, you've lost four clients. Does that have anything to do with the film Dean Palermo's making about you? Miss Gilman, I don't lose clients. They're all mutual partings. Okay, well, since the last time we interviewed you, you've lost seven assistants. That's an extraordinary number. Oh, Mrs. Gilman, you know, you may not have noticed, but I am an intense guy. Very intense, but very stable nonetheless. Oh, sure, I fly off the handle, but there's nothing wrong with me. Hey, I said two slices of rye. Two! <laughs> Enter. Have you seen the first cut of the Steven Seagal musical, gentlemen? We agree, Sam. It could be the next Heaven's Gate. <laughs> my Heaven's Gate. This is a tricky time, my friends. We need to keep a lid on this. I can't afford any leaks, any bad publicity. Let's not give the press another bone. Uh, how about that movie my daughter's been making? Is there any mention of that in the trades? No, there's been no news, Sam. A good thing. Mm -hmm. Parker. So what brought you out to Hollywood, Mr. Pink? You know, when, when I was a kid, I saw a movie that changed my life forever. The Star Wars. Oh, I love that movie. Hey, you know, I used to have a Star Wars comforter. I still do. Wait a minute, you still have it, Mr. Pink? The Force touched me. Yeah, it, it touched me.
then I decided then and there that I was going to come out to Hollywood. Because I thought that there was no way in the world that a place that could create such magic could be as bad as everybody said. But then I came out to Hollywood, and I can't stop asking myself, where's the force, Pink? Where's the force? You see, to me, film is not just a business. Films are powerful. They affect people. They make them think about a lot of things. I didn't come out to Hollywood for the six figures. I came out here because I wanted to be part of the most influential art form of the 20th century. I don't care how influential these films are. I just want my big beach house in Malibu. Mm -hmm. Is that why you chose Hollywood? Well, see, in all other professions, it takes years to get anywhere. But in Hollywood, a young man can strike it rich overnight. You people can delude yourselves into thinking that there are morals, that you can be a pure artist in this business. But sooner or later, everyone gives in a temptation. Everyone. See, this isn't a movie. And, uh, the force is not with you. <laughs> You have been accepted into my very selective program because you want to be players. The first thing you must ask yourself is, what is the player? What do these men and women, these elite, upwardly mobile individuals have in common? Well, they didn't go to film school. Because in case you hadn't realized it yet, Hollywood does not give a shit about how much you know about Godard or the French New Wave. Rhino skin, schmoozing, cow meetings, information, chutzpah, personal survival. Once you have mastered all these fine arts, you're halfway there. And then you must take all these skills and retail it yourself to fit the ideal. Think of yourself as this lonely mort coming out of a cocoon and emerging into this beautiful butterfly with a go project under his or her wing. Shmo! I really love that tie. It's very Picasso-esque. Well, Picasso is one of my favorite artists extremely visual. In fact, if he were alive today, he'd probably be a great filmmaker like Soderbergh or Schumacher. Excellent! Hollywood is too obsessed with these cute kids. I think Mac's gonna be another Dana Plato, Todd Bridges, different kind of strokes casualty. Totally. Wait up! Well, you see, I'm not exactly athletic, but, uh, you know, I do like to every now and then get out, play a little miniature golf from time to time. Stop! Introducing the marks are cultural and artistic. Both introduction and response was Putnam-esque. Hollywood does not like lardasses. If you don't have an athletic hobby, then choose one, golf or tennis. And every Los Angeles team should be second nature to you. I cavalt. Oh my god. Mensch. Shut the person. Shayna Boydship. Pretty boy. Zolza Narako Voxen Via on Always Gakken Pestan. May you grow up like a trolley car and shit passengers out of your ass. Golden rule when you make the big leagues. If it's a hit, it's, it's mine. mine. If it bombs, it's mine. It's, it's theirs. You are now ready to take the reins and stake your turf in Hollywoods and claim your new identities. Ralph Panties, you are now Carrie Hitchcock. Always an attention grabber. Fisher Lovely. You are now Denzel Coppola. It'll open many, many doors. <laughs> Paulette Gittleman, you don't need to change your name unless your dad gets involved in a scandal. Thomas Jacobson. Um, Giuseppe Jacobson. <laughs> Italian, Jewish origins. You have the passion of an artist and the savvé of a shrewd businessman. You. 
see me after class. You know, I cannot believe that I failed a course on how to schmooze and kiss ass. I'm doomed out here. Come on, Mr. Pink. Schmoozing and networking is an art form like, like screenplays. You learn the rules and then you practice them like the rest of us. No, forget it. You know, my mother, she says, you're socially awkward, and socially awkward people should not go to Hollywood. And she's right. And Schnell, she says I should consider dentistry, just like my mother. Oh, come on, Mr. Pink. Look at us. You think we're blessed with Hollywood personalities? Why are you trying to instill false hope in him? Dentistry's a nice profession, Mr. Pink. Quiet, fish. No, don't quiet me, man. I'm being honest. We're talking about his life here. Shh. You can do it, Mr. Pink. No, I, I can't. Schnell's just one person, Pink. Her word isn't sacred. Yeah, nothing's sacred out here. Well, except for cars, lunches, and green lights. Oh, my. Cars, lunches, and green lights. Oh, my. Go ahead, Paulette. Tell him. Do you think he could do it? Yeah, I think you could do it, Pink. See? Paulette's lived in this town her entire life. She could spot a player a mile away. Really? Yeah. Besides, you're as smart as anyone else. That's true. I am smart. You're good looking, too. Good looking? You know, I am feeling rather good looking today. And you can learn how to schmooze. You're right. I can learn how to schmooze. We can do it. Cars, lunches, green lights. Oh my. Cars, lunches, green lights. Oh my. The future of Hollywood. Let's go. We can play the game. We can play the game. Excuse me, sir, but can we do without the music today, please? I mean, how about I take you to lunch? Pink, why you always keep everything so neat, huh? Metalheads are never neat or clean shaven, and yet you, you're all these things. Maybe I'm schizophrenic, like you. Like father and son, party down! Thanks. Uh, Thomas, isn't it? Yes, sir. What the? So, um. Yes. Grab the reins, seize the moment. I really liked your children, sir. Well, I'm glad Roman scheduled you to spend more time with them over the next few weeks. Good day, Thomas. Jews who were from Manhattan. Months have gone by, kind of a midway point, so we're gonna check in and do some one-on-one -on -one interviews. Roger says I've been doing a great job. You know, I mean, he, he thinks things are definitely gonna work out for me, as, as long as certain adjustments are made. Uh, you look like you're going on Soul Train, Fish. Oh, come on, man, it's not that bad. I mean, it's kind of like celebrating Halloween every day. <laughs> I love Halloween. My mother, though, she's been getting so spikely on me, man. I don't know. You know. That woman, she thinks Roger's trying to get in my pants. Is he? <laughs> I mean, sure, there's, there's, there's a lot of compromise, but that's in everything. You know, there's, 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 as long as you know yourself, <laughs> there's no danger. Well, Roger, how's the wig look? It, it looks... Looks, I mean, it looks good. You know, I, I like the way it looks, but oh, good. I mean, it may not be. I sense hesitation. No, 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 no. And I'm just, no, I'm just saying it may not be exactly what we're looking. Have for. I led you wrong before, Fisher? Huh? No. Have it's, I? Superfly. You won't wear it. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. You'll see it. You see? I mean, it's dope. I mean, hey. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm stepping out. Yeah. My project for today. Oh, I thought I'd do some planning while I'm talking to you. You know, I love viruses. 
I used to uh, grow them on my balcony in New York. I had a beautiful, I made a beautiful wooden box planter. It's wonderful, mm. it's fabulous. Can I ask you something a bit more personal? Sure, go ahead. Why do you put up with this abuse? <laughs> well, you know, after looking at myself in the mirror for over 27 years, I've come to realize certain truths about myself. And one of them is I'm just not an overnighter. Overnighter? Oh, yeah. You know, like, uh, Oh, all the guys, Jacobson even. You know, they're overnighters. They look good, they say the right things, they have a certain charisma. I don't have those things. You know, I don't even have luck, except for bad luck. But uh, I have a theory, though, why that's all okay. My first girlfriend was, uh, she was into astrology, and she taught me a lot about Libra. Anyway, she told me that Librans weigh everything out. We're slow in making decisions. You know, we weigh the positive and the negative, different approaches, and that's me. So I think, you know, I'll give a little here to get a lot more there. And you know, that's gonna work for me. I know it's gonna work for me. So one day, maybe not now, maybe not in five years, maybe not even in 10 years, I sure as hell am gonna beat this town. I'm gonna do it, I know I'm gonna do it. I have what it takes. Remember how we started to talk about having a company and, you know, doing business together? Vaguely. I got two tickets to the Oscars this year. Mm. Jack Palance is lap dancing. <laughs> I'm not interested. No? Looks like we have company. They're just street punks. Street punks. Go ahead. Rapinski! Roman. Rapinski! Roman! Roman, who were those guys? I've never seen them before in my life. They look dangerous, though. Uh, Listen, I gotta go back to the office. But Roman... I'll give you a call later tonight. I can't believe I'm doing this. How are you? Hey, Thanks for coming Thomas. by, man. We are gonna have a blast tonight. Listen, I gotta show you something real quick. I just finished taping about 15 minutes ago. Okay. Roman. Oh, God. He's at the Oscar parties. Get this. He called and left a message that my name would be on the list of all the big parties. Really? Maybe I misjudged him. We're not, we're not with the press. I'm, I'm supposed to be going inside. So there's nobody going inside. As far as we know, nobody can go inside the other name. For? There's nobody going to go inside. Why not? I mean, I'm, my name's Thomas Jacobson. I'm supposed to be going here. We're... We have to go in there. And then we're not, we're not press. Who's this? We're not press. Okay, then you can't be in here. Right, that's what I'm trying to... I'm okay. supposed to be going inside. Right. Come around here and please leave. Thank you. Hey, Thomas. <laughs> Hope you didn't take me seriously. I only have passes for myself and my date. Oh, she's gonna be one of those chicks on Baywatch. Oh, and Mr. Sabine's kids need to be taken to the <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese is tomorrow. <laughs> Later. The mailroom is where tomorrow's moguls learn the nature of the deal. But it's here at exclusive networking parties where they hone and practice the art of schmooze. <laughs> Here it is. Every prayer, the first 30 pages. This is for real? Of course. We deliver like the postman, so fine. I'll message her over the cash tomorrow. Good doing business with you. My mom wants me to sue him for sexual harassment. No, 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 don't sue, don't sue. You'll get blackballed. But that's what I tell her. I mean, I tell her. But I tell her I'm in control of the situation because soon the pain will only be a memory. Because with one promotion, I'll be in charge of supervising a bunch of my own videos. Yeah, yeah, stick it out, stick it out. Look, pain is temporary. Mobile hood is forever. I'm on the guest list. No guest list, Chief. No, but I'm on the guest list. No list, Chief. Take a hike. Lucille, Lucille. Mm. Five more minutes. I would have shown up into a prune. Ooh, my honey, my angel, my baby, my saving grace. I missed you. Oh, you look great. You look like Nipsey Russell. Come here. I'm not going to kiss you. You probably got a cold sore. I just heard this incredible story about this guy who's perpetually stuck in the mail room. They call it, uh, what, what, AF, Assistant Forever? Yeah, everybody knows it except this guy. What's his name? John 
Jehovah Lamb. Hey. 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 hey, so anyway, hey, I was thinking, so it's like, you know, I'm going to good grades. <laughs> Come on, why not? You are wasting your time. Hey, eventually you're gonna come to your senses, all right? And partner with you? Hey, Wolfgang said so on our first oh, date. Oh, God, here we go again. The two of you would make wonderful <laughs> business partners. He was drunk on turtle pate. The man is more than a chef, Paula. Oh, Roman, nobody is one thing in this town. Every waiter is an actor. Every agent is a future producer. Every studio executive is a closet screenwriter. So what? Everybody's got a hidden agenda. Yeah. And I don't trust yours. You guys okay? <laughs> I'm assistant forever. <laughs> my girlfriend left. I want to talk to my mom a lot. Hey, Pink. How you doing? I hate this place. I hate this place. You now I wish a great rain would come and wash all the scum into the gutter. I just got a call from Pink. He doesn't sound very good. I'm a little bit worried about him. Are you okay? Hi, guys. What happened? I uh, don't like irises anymore. I don't like them at all. But everything's fine. They're still pretty. Paulette? anymore. What time? Now? Stage 15. Okay. Is he mad? I have to go see my dad. Let's see what my little girl looks like these days. You look anemic. Well, that's not normal for a healthy woman of your age. Well, the movie's taken a lot out of me. Some movies get made which shouldn't. And some poor fools got to show the most of the responsibility. Small blurb in this morning's trades. Paulette Gittleman, daughter of studio chief Sam Gittleman, is making waves in Tinseltown 
directing her documentary feature Slaves of Hollywood, according to an anonymous source who's featured in the movie. If this oh. film ever finds a distributor, there will be lots of destroyed careers. Heidi Fleiss' book couldn't compete with the potential smut of this film. Dad. I continue to read. Ms. Gittleman might be smart in reevaluating her slanderous approach. Some wonder where Sam Gittleman fits into this puzzle. Could Paulette be doing this in the name of her father? If so, it certainly cannot help the tidal wave of negative criticism he's already receiving from his studio Mega Monster Musical, which some have nicknamed Singing Seagal. It's a cheap shot. Your reporter friends are looking for any excuse to undermine you. It's bullshit. Like everything else. But the rest of this town doesn't see it that way. Because when it stinks, people tend to believe it. That's their problem. That's what you said when I asked you not to make this movie. Remember? I said, Paulette, this isn't the kind of movie that's going to ingratiate you to Hollywood. Hey, that's their problem, you said. Are you familiar with the meaning of the term Putnam-esque, named for David Putnam, the ill-fated former head of Columbia Pictures? Enlighten me. Oh, I'll enlighten you. It's when one thinks he or she can put a wrinkle in the system. It's that messianic, I can save Tinseltown from falling into the Pacific, suck my dick. I want to see more films about minorities and relationships, anti-box office mentality. Well, you know what becomes of that same self-seeking, sweet-talking revolutionary? He finds himself the proud owner of a new black ball. A top of the line, screw you, eat shit, die, and never eat lunch in this town again certificate. Even one enemy is an enemy you can't afford, Paulette. I'm not making any enemies from this film. That bovine scatology! From the day you started making the movie, you've been lighting a flame under other assholes to feed your own moral fires. You want to make a change? Go fight world hunger. But don't screw with the players in this town, Paulette. Those weren't my intentions. Screw your intentions! Nobody cares about what you intended. That's what people are going to say. Once they smell a rat, everyone keeps away from you like you're the plague. I've seen it happen. I've perpetrated it on others. It's not a pretty sight. Well, I appreciate your concern for my reputation. It's sort of like a studio head's concern for keeping costs down on a film. But you don't own my negative. And you're not gonna stop me from finishing my movie. Then as your father, I pronounce your film dead. I've written an apology on yours in my behalf, which will be published in tomorrow's trades. And I've seen that nobody in this industry, not a single vendor, actor or director, will consort or attempt in any way to assist you in completing this project. I have spies everywhere. If you're shooting in town, I'll know about it. Even as we speak, your cameraman is being escorted off the lot and the camera returned to the rental house. If you're even able to find another camera, you won't be able to find film for it. If you need a shooting permit, you'll be turned down. down. many times, Paulette. Each time I just thought back to what my first film teacher said. Making a film is like going to war. It's, it's kill or be killed. My father shut down my film, Dean. What could I do? Paulette, when you're down at your lowest moment, that's when you discover what you're truly made of. The mark of a true artist. Coppola. Palermo. Mr. LaRoche has destroyed my equipment and trashed my film. It was just another typical day of filming. I'll 
show you a fucking box of chunks, you fucking bastard! Get back here so I can tell you! say the climax is the most important part anyway. A few weeks ago, after LaRoche had destroyed my camera and decided to join my beloved Bolex. presentation. I'm prepared to continue our safari through the jungles of Hollywood. I got my camera back. And you know my movie? The one the roach destroyed? I've got some old stock and some short ends I've saved from that film. Now, if you agree to include my finale in your film, I'll let you borrow the stock and the camera to finish your film. Put the climax of your movie in my movie. In exchange for a priceless player my tea. It's different. But I'll do it. <sighs> then it's a deal. Wow, this thing actually still works. This is great. Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> oh my hey, don't God. be scared, lady. We just want to know how you know Lenny Rapinski. L Lenny Rapinski? Who, who's Lenny Rapinski? Who's Lenny Rapinski? Look, lady, we bash your skull, and I bet you remember who he is. He's a T-bone. <sighs> Wait a second. You're the guys. You're the guys who chased after Roman Sofine the other day. Who the fuck is Roman Sofine? Roman so Roman so fine. That's the name he must be going by now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> who who are you guys? Little lady, we got some talking to do. Now I don't know what Lenny Rapinski told you about himself, but I guarantee it was all bullshit. He was a street kid, grew up on the boulevard just like me and the boys here. His favorite thing in the world was picking off little rich kids. Anybody who had more than he did. We liked them. He was always one charming motherfucker. The guy was good with the knife, too, and you can always use somebody like that on your team. So we decided to see if he had what it took to be one of us. If you haven't figured it out already, sweetheart, we ain't the Salvation Army. That's not to say we don't collect things. Our specialty is other people's merchandise. You know, tourists. Because we do most of our work on Hollywood Boulevard. One day grifting on the boulevard, you could make enough money to live for a month. We were loaded, and still, it wasn't enough. But then there was that score when we knocked over a carload of oil sheiks. 
We'd never seen so much cash in our lives. We partied our asses off. But when we woke up, the score was gone, and so was Lenny Rapinski. We don't know what happened to the son of a bitch after that, but we've been looking for him ever since. Lenny Rapinski, I've had all kinds of people come through this classroom, but you are definitely a special case. You're in luck, because I'm gonna take you under my wing. You're a raw slab of clay, beautiful clay. You must first reinvent yourself entirely, get a new car and a new place to live. It doesn't matter where you get the money to do this. Study the books that I've prescribed. This is a business in which hairdressers can become moguls, farm boys can become big stars, and two-bit floozies can become legendary divas. Anyone can make it in this town, darling. You've just got to be willing to do whatever it takes. You can do this, Lenny. And I've got just the place for you to get that beautiful foot of yours in the door. Studio lots are notoriously easy to sneak onto. Steven Spielberg, also one of my students, by the way, snuck onto the Universal lot disguised as a producer's son. But you, Lenny, you will be a messenger. Once you go through those fabled arches, all you need to find is someone clueless enough to help you make the right contacts. Like a studio executive's daughter, and from this day forward, you will no longer be Lenny Rapinski. You shall be Roman so fine. Hey, you guys, thanks for agreeing to come back for one last time. What the hell are we doing out here in the middle of the desert, Paulette? It's awful hot out here, Paulette. I know, but my dad won't find us out here. How are you guys doing? I've been having some really fucked up dreams lately. Here. Oh, I... Hey, uh... <clears throat> here, huh? Yep. Hey, Joe, just one. One. Okay, Mom. Here, give me some of that. Hey, Thomas, how was your vacation? It was the worst weekend of my life. Die, die, no. Die, die, no. Die, no. Die, no. Uh, oh. Thomas, you take my matzo ball. No, Pop, you need it more than I do. Ah, <laughs> uh, my grandson, Thomas. <laughs> my son's boy, <laughs> who I love more than life itself. He writes me letters about his great fortune. <laughs> But for once, I want to hear it from the horse's mouth. Go on. Tell me about life as a big Hollywood agent. Go ahead, don't be shy. <laughs> a wise man is never shy about his successes. I'm quitting. <laughs> so we had another stroke. Now I'm never gonna be able to quit. Not until he dies, and by that time, I'll probably be dead myself. Hey, Fisher. Yeah? Tell me about those dreams you've been having. I had this dream last night. I was 40 years old, had this horrible car accident and died. Jeez. And the only people at my funeral were Roger, Pansy and Polly. Roger's having this big party tonight. He said he's gonna be watching me real closely. Um. <laughs> and? Fuck Roger! I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore! I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore! Yeah! <laughs> Put Moses to the Pharaoh! Let my people go! <laughs> <laughs>
Take it, guys, sir! I'm not gonna take it anymore, you sick fuck! You fucking dick! You take it now! How does that feel, you bitch! Palermo's Climax, take one. Fredo, I know it was you. You broke my heart. Get me the fuck out of here. No, 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 I can't. Michael no, Eisner's I, I just, I, Yeah, I, get on the road for I, uh, Michael Eisner. I don't want to do what I can. I, I mean, I can't get on the fucking phone. I need to be on the fucking phone. Please right. read exactly what I've written. Hi, Griffin, Michael. <laughs> Griffin. <laughs> Griffin, what the hell is going on? Oh, she fucking you. This is Michael. Mm -hmm. Michael? Yeah, he's Michael. You, what the fucking mouse, and what fucking duck, and that fucking poisonous fucking man, Bruno, you son of a bitch. Goodbye. <laughs> Schwarzenegger. <laughs> you know that your name means fucking black plowman. <laughs> no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Thanks. I knew you had it in you. <laughs> Thanks. Could you please excuse us? Sure. Paulette, you gotta congratulate me on my big day. You're gonna go out with me tonight. I'm not going out with you tonight. <sighs> come on, everybody's taking me out. I want you to come. Actually, I'm going out with five guys. What's their names? I have a picture. There's Izzy, Butch, Little John, Tommy, Lenny Rapinski. I haven't met him yet. They look like nice guys, but I don't know. Sure you don't, Lenny. Let me get a picture here. Roman, let's get a picture. I knew you'd make it. Thanks. Smile. Thanks, guys. You can't fucking touch me, Paulette. I'm an agent now. You think the agency's gonna let something like this slip by? Why not? Plenty of guys in the agency have dubious backgrounds. <laughs> All they care about is if you get the job done. End of story. I'll hold that elevator. Good day, Thomas. Good day, Mr. Sabine. I thought you'd like to know something about Roman and the Astor House spec script. Enter. Please. Make yourself at home.
So, I never thought I would see you again, Paulette. In retrospect, I might have been a little bit hard on you, but it was all for your own good. So I assume that you've gotten this movie out of your system and you're here to come back to work with me at the studio. I am correct in these assumptions. I'm leaving Los Angeles next week, and I'm not, I'm not planning on coming back. <laughs> Goodbye, Dad. Paulette! party yeah. I think we're gonna be really good friends <laughs> <laughs>